I'm uh, Bruce Ashfield. Um, I work for AMD, but um, you can't, and formerly, well, Xilinx slash AMD. Uh, you, I am not here to talk about what Xilinx and AMD really do uh, with the kernel and build system, because that's actually other people <laughs> than me. Uh, I, I uh, full disclosure, I have been uh, maintaining the kernel in the Yocto project since, since it started and maintaining distribution kernels since roughly 2006. So um, I've been at it uh, for a little while now. Um, and my talk is mainly some points. I'm going to reference how it's done and open and better than the Yocto project, because of course that's um, what I know and what I do daily. And other than that, it's sort of open questions and um, to see if anybody has thoughts or how they've solved uh, the similar problems that we run into um, when we're doing our, our kernels. So the one thing that I will say to start is you, um, as I've learned many, many times, you absolutely cannot keep everybody happy at the same time. So either your build is too slow, your build is not reproducible, your build isn't hashed, your build the developer shell, the debug cycle isn't as fast as somebody wants it. And that's all the things that you're sort of about, or the build artifacts aren't in a place that can be distributed. Or they're not assembled into the right type of image or you boot isn't synchronized with it. Or, you know, this, uh, I have a binary blob and a bootloader and my module auto load and my UPA. <laughs> so these are, you know, there's absolutely, as far as I found, um, anybody tells you that they're solving all of these, uh, problems at the solve time, same time and everybody is happy. Um, I think they're either lying or they haven't shared their build system with the rest of us. And, and either one of those is probably not a good thing. Um, but yet we try. Um, I don't know, that's probably not, uh, probably not readable to the people in here as I've been watching them that I should have figured out how to do um, uh, bigger fonts. In fact, I can barely read it on the laptop screen here in front of me. Um, all I was, all of this um, illustration was supposed to show is that, you know, you have, say, maybe core aspects of your build system and things that you care about. And those are the pillars here. So, you know, how do you configure the kernel in a way that matches different types of hardware? If Because uh, I come from an embedded background. So um, we're not talking about an all yes config, all mod config. All We're talking about lots of different configurations that vary based on not just the board, but a carrier card on the board or dynamically delivered um, hardware if you're using an FPGA based platform, right? So is the configuration a core pillar of your build system? Is it reproducibility? Uh, flexibility, meaning I can build lots of architectures, many different types of kernel image, one for performance, one for debug, uh, one for whatever. Um, is it, oh my goodness, that one's really small. Maintenance and support. <laughs> um, image creation and build speed, which is actually the one that I would say, uh, I really can't keep everybody happy at the, all uh, at the same time. And of course, you know, is it uh, associated with maintenance and support would be, uh, you know, how do I debug the kernel um, if I have a problem? Um, and of course, on the top of that is the outputs, you know, your kernels, your modules, your DTBs, your user space configuration. UAPI headers, you know, because as part of what we do in the, the Octa project is I, I maintain along with the kernel upgrades, I produce the Linux libc headers package, which is the export of uh, the UPA, UAPI headers for every release that we synchronize it with the kernel. You know, is there firmware, is there debug? And nowadays, is there SBOM? Is there um, other information that's coming out of the kernel build so you can trace these modules and everything back to the source file? And of course, at the bottom, it's, you know, what is your, what version are you building? What's your release cadence? Um, you know, uh, where does the source come from? Because as soon as you talk about, especially embedded kernels, um, you'll immediately find um, the forest of different kernel trees that are of various vintages and uh, various maintenance quality. So yeah, these are the sort of the inputs at the bottom going through the pillars, and then those are your outputs at the top. And, you know, trying to balance those um, within a build system is not, um, not always easy or never easy. There you go. Those are the, that, that summarizes down to the ins and the outs. Seems pretty simple, source, configuration and policy, um, some security information, whether it's keys or you know, provenance or something, um, which is, that's evolving nowadays. 
And the outs are, I would say, your kernel and your supporting binaries, your boot artifacts, um, whether it's scripts, device tree, firmware. You know, we have different packages and images. I have something about that because everybody packages things up differently. And then the outputs, the traceability, I would call it, and your licensing. So that's your debug, your SBOM, and your CVE information. So simple. And then the extras. Um, and this is what we run into as using doing the kernel as part of a build system. Every time I do an upgrade or an uprev uh, for open embedded in the Yocto project, there's a set of user space packages that I know will break and that I have to fix before I can get a new reference kernel into the project. So, you know, really tightly uh, coupled would be the compiler and the libc headers. I have to, to upgrade those and, and make sure, and then build the entire user space uh, against those headers to see if anything broke. Um, and it's not in the sense of the last talk, we're not really concerned about ABI issues, literally compilation failures um, um, pop up on several packages quite a bit. Um, whether they're poking at files they shouldn't be or not, that's a different question, but they, it breaks in. I can't do a kernel until they're upgraded, until they're fixed. And then there's things like LTTNG, perf, and system tap that are part of the kernel source tree, if you will, or very close to it, but they always need to have their user space component up revved at the same time, again, before I can actually put out a new uh, kernel version as part of uh, our build system. There's no way to do one without the other or it's broken and it doesn't go in. And then um, we also output, are there, you know, we generate SDKs. Uh, the Octa project and OE has something in an extended SDK. We have different ways that you can build um, out of tree modules against it, on target, off target, um, and the build artifacts. And then, you know, we produce a, um, if you're familiar with how Open Embedded does things, there's um, shared states and different things that will accelerate your next builds. And because of the sheer volume of the, the, the kernel source, how much there is, years ago, um, for all the things that needed to reference, we do the compiler the same way. Um, there's a shared uh, kernel source directory that it has to get copied to, so that's produced and it has to be valid. And of course, we then produce everything from containers to VMs to unit kernels. Uh, so those are the extras. So you know that's all that you have to worry about when um, somebody says, why don't you just jump to the next available kernel? And in fact, we got a little bit surprised in our just past release where the kernel I was planning on releasing got EOL'd um, before our release, even though we had gone through all of this validation. So we had to very quickly jump to 6.5 and do about a month and a half's work in six days. Um, so we are getting better. We can actually get through most of this stuff in two or three days now when it used to take a lot longer uh, to validate the system. Um, I'm sort of, I know, presenting right now for a lot more um, questions coming up, but if anybody does have any uh, comments on any of that, if I've missed an important output or something like that, please uh, do interrupt me and let me know. Um, the way that I would say the real juggling um, that comes in in that first um, image that I did. Um, all right, I wasn't sure if you had a question or you were just getting the cube there, Phil. I'm getting ready. All right, good. Uh, <laughs> Is it. is your no the persona like the, here's the question it's like are you doing some kind of release build is it uh, you know release load build are you talking about a production build out of your build system for a kernel that will be formally released or is it somebody who's just sitting at the keyboard and they're doing development right whether they're doing kernel development or user space development with some sort of interface between the team right so are they in a build right these are, that's another distinctly different persona right it's it's absolutely different is it somebody that is just integrating uh you know they're, they're pulling things together um if you will like an, an operating system vendor right are they pulling the different bits together versus even developing uh, they're not doing any development they're not doing the debug but <laughs> they're taking your tree and they're integrating it into their own product or their own images um are you then the person that that integrator might hand it to are you the distributor um what you need out of a kernel build in a build system would be different yet again um, what are they providing? Does your build system produce what they need to be able to hand it off to somebody else? You know, and, and these days that would be go back to my licensing SBOM, all that stuff, right? It has to be output as part of your build. So they have a way to um, verify with whoever they're handing it to uh, that they know what it is and where it came from. Or are you just a community member and a contributor and you're working on uh, a new SOC and you and you want to get support for it, or you have a problem and you're sending a patch, right? And there's probably more. 
those are just the ones I came up with thinking about it for two minutes, and I'm sure there's more. And my question is, you know, in your build system, you know, do you have a primary persona and you know target, right? And 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 does your build system optimize for that kind of workflow? Because I can tell you, working in open embedded, that we we don't optimize for the develop this developer guy who's doing the build and debug cycle within open embedded. Um, I don't know if anybody does build and do development, kernel development in OE. I'd be interested if you told me that you are actually using <laughs> BitBake and the some of the build, how you're using um, the flow that we have to do your maybe your quicker development. Because um, in my experience, kernel developers just want a cross compiler, a kernel source tree, and then they want to get the images quickly to a target somehow in the test it. They don't want any overhead at all whatsoever from a build system, parsing files and generating packages and RPMs and release scripts and all this stuff. They don't need that, right? So, um, and that is what you would get if you do bit big virtual kernel in the Yocta project, you're an open embedded, you will get all that extra stuff whether you are planning on using it or not. Um, so, you know, that's my big question is when you're worrying about this, it's like, do you have somebody in mind uh, that you're trying to, a persona that you're worried about? questions good i'll just keep going um i had one question going back to the uapi stuff um you're you said that um when you upgrade you basically just build the world and look for failures um should you be thinking about doing the uapi script and looking at those just to see where the changes are ahead of time yeah to try and make that loop a little bit quicker it's something we could do yeah it's literally bruce knows that seven packages are break and I go build them and then yeah. attempt to fix them. I mean, it sounds like you, the, you, you know which packages are going to break most yeah. likely, but this, I think, would maybe make the world... But it would help go. if if I'm not doing this anymore, the next person might not know the seven packages because they've exactly. been doing it for 10 yeah. years now. Um, yeah, and the, the, I was saying to John in the back, the problem, the difference a little bit with the way that, say, a kernel and a build system from that point of view is we're not doing kernel development in the sense yeah. that when we jump from, well, I do every kernel as a dev kernel, then we do a release. So every version is looked at at some point, not in as much detail. Um, we're doing it for from 6.4 to 6.5. So if I have a UAPI header failure, you then really need to bisect the 7,500 commit. Like it, the, the, it would be interesting to know that there was a UAPI failure, but really it wouldn't tell us where it was yet till we went yeah. and actually went, we would have to then have a, uh, I would still have to do the follow-up and and uh, do the bisection. Yeah. I mean, it might also help um, people driving kernels and maintaining their own kernels and giving them warnings when they have added a driver that has an unstable API. Well, yes, especially in our world with the evil vendor trees and, yeah. um, and the people who add their own patches and their own patches that we we could we we could uh, we could publish literally the UAPIs like when we when I when I validated um, six five four with the you know Linux libc headers this is you no know, that's your reference for the what we built for UAPI and if you if it changes from that whoever's handing you their tree their kernel tree has done something uh, yeah. that you might want to look into or you know we could even just add a task in our build system that you could just run UAPI check against whatever your tree was and we could have a reference somewhere. There's, there's, there's probably something that we could do there. Yeah, I mean, I'm yeah. just trying to think how you would integrate this yeah. tool into a build system to give you useful information that you could do something with. Absolutely. Yeah, and like I said, my thought was that it, the integration would be easy, but yeah, the how do I find? How do I use How do I use it to, to find? Uh, the the commit that caused the problem, yeah. right? And that, uh, I wouldn't want to leave you just that it's broken. You want to yeah. be able to figure out uh, where it is. So I just wanted, uh, yeah. So the next thing I wanted to just to summarize before I got into more questions was, in case people aren't familiar with how we do the the you know the kernel and open embedded, in the sense that it is an absolutely flexible um, provider model. Um, it's uh, you know virtual kernel. Uh, your kernel recipe can provide that and the rest of the system keys off that as part of the build. 
And so that means that, you know, your sources, your patches, your configuration, um, they're yours in your tree and however you are provided. There is no one um, golden tree. You'll, I'll talk about the reference kernel in a minute, but that is not any kind of um, uh, golden reference or single provider, right? But that prevents us uh, many challenges uh, throughout the ecosystem in the sense that I keep talking about, you know, that's why when we do a release, we say, this is the reference kernel, this is the reference kernel version, and these are the Linux libc headers and blah, blah, blah. And if you are in that same version cadence, it should be pretty pretty well off. But that's the best we can do um, for the most part because, uh, and in particular, it causes us trouble with uh, tightly coupled, to, like we package perf as part of the kernel build system work. Um, we can't actually ever patch it if there's a problem because we don't know what kernel version you're building, what kernel tree you're building. Uh, so we have, if you look at our perf recipe, there's all kinds of said operations to change, to fix problems on the source code if they're there um, because we can't patch it. So that, those are the type of challenges that your build system and the providing a kernel may, um, and maybe you, somebody will say another build system, they may just take a copy of the perf source so they can patch it and maintain it like, um, as they will, but then we would have a version of perf that doesn't match everybody's evil vendor kernel versions. I think you can perf. use the latest version of perf. It's supposed to be backwards compatible. For the most part, yeah, but we have, it's just such a, like in our, in our world, it's just such a drastic different set of uh, kernels that we've never, we've never tried that. But we do that with the libc headers. Like I, I go to the next major kernel version release and we do not, we actually have warnings in all of those files that says do not provide your own libc headers because if you're not using our version for older or newer, they're compatible, right? And there might be something we could do around uh, perf. But nowadays it doesn't cause as nearly as much trouble as I would say it did four or five years ago for, for breakage. So, um, but there'll be another tool that gets integrated that causes us another uh, similar issue. Yeah, I mean, tools, tools tends to break once or twice a year in my experience from user space headers. And it's always during the merge window and it's the tool needs something new that is now in kernel headers, but because like by, by default, uh, like rel builds the, the tools as part of the kernel package, you build at the same time, <clears throat> excuse me, it doesn't work. Uh, but because like Fedora tracks upstream the way we do, we build our kernel headers package separately so that we can get around that problem. I can build it and then use it as the new package as the build depth for building right. the tools and, and it's solved. Yeah. Um, Can I just ask a quick reference question here? How many people here work with the latest released kernel? How many people work with blankety blank vendor trees? Okay, so it's about 50-50. Much pain in the room, no. <laughs> and the other thing that we've run into with uh, the build, the complexity, uh, you know, I, I, if Richard was here, are you, are you listening, Richard? Somebody tell me if he's listening. Yeah. Um, that both of us are actually quite afraid to go in and touch the kernel packaging parts of Open Embedded, for example, because it's there's a lot of complexity in the different types of kernel, uh, especially in Embedded, the different types of output formats and the way you package the kernel, whether it's a fit image, whether it's, a, uh, you know, it, is it There's signed? So and but anyway, the, and the point is at, at init RAMFS and, and we end up with a recursive build where we're actually building the kernel for the init RAMFS, but it's not the one that's booting because there's a pivot root. And, and everybody goes in and there's conditionals all through the build system, your build system to handle all these cases. And, you know, are they signed? Are they, it's like, anyway, it's, um, and then and we're, how are the kernel modules? Um, package along. So the multiple output types, um, in my experience, if you live in a very single architecture worried, whatever, maybe your build system is great for optimizing for that. But as soon as you live in like a multi-platform, multi-tree, um, multi-architecture world, it's there's a lot of complexity in a build system to try to handle those output formats. And every time you change it, somebody, yes, does pop up that you didn't even know was building it in that way. So there's that, this is what I've been hinting at. So if you don't, you know, what, what, you know, what about a reference? How can you do this in a world in a build system that maybe doesn't have one kernel where you can switch your kernel out fairly easily? And what about a reference? So this is what we do in the Octa project and open embedded, right? So we have 
you know, that get we, we do have a reference kernel that follows the release cadence of the Octa project, so twice a year. Um, we release basically, there's a dev kernel, which would be the latest at the time we released. It's sort of experimental. There is a release reference kernel and there's an LTS kernel. So there's three versions in every release. So that's how we sort of solve the problem. And the leading edge of those versions, that's what drives us to make sure that the kernel is part of the build system, all the tools and everything does work with the, the latest. So that is what drives sort of, and um, those, those tightly coupled packages, and it allows us to um, test the workflows, the personas uh, that we're talking against the tree. So it drives those kind of changes that we have a reference um, kernel. And you know, it also it allows us to test more easily some of the, um, we have different flavors of the kernel, whether it's real time or tiny or standard developer or whatever. So it having a reference in the build system, whether you expect somebody to deploy it either in production or on their particular board is a good thing because we need it to drive these things as part of the build system. Um, as we get more and more along to the utopia of all upstreamed patches and uh, generic ARM64 images and generic x86 images, it will be easier to have fewer of the vendor trees and maybe the reference will be even more useful uh, at that point. We don't need that. Uh, how am I doing? I don't even know how I'm doing for time. Good. This is not interesting. We don't need this. Uh, this is the, this is all the little bits and pieces that are underneath the um, how the reference kernel builds in, in open embedded, but uh, we don't need that. Um, so the, the this is the more discussion part of my presentation. That's about all I um, prepared for sort of the problems and what open embedded does and and things like that. So. But sort of the challenges, what I'm saying when you're doing kernel and build system and AK, they're also open questions is, you know, it's the infinite different entrenched workflows, right? Do you care about um, the infinite number of entrenched workflows for people to do configure, build, deploy, boot, debug? How do they manage their patches? What do they like to use? How is it tracked, right? So, you know, do you pick yours and run with it or do you allow variation in the build system so they can use their entrenched workflow. Um, this is, we already covered this, but it's worth saying again, especially for the recording. Uh, you know, there's many different kernel source trees out there. Yeah, we should all be using upstream kernel.org, but um, reality, especially embedded is that's not always possible. And you end up with hundreds of um, different BSBs and how do you manage to end of life? Because, you know, uh, you'll have somebody pop up trying to build their 2.6 kernel, literally, still, <laughs> with open embedded and trying to find the it. the best kernel. <laughs> and trying to ask us if we can still support it as part of the build system, and there's just things that have moved on, and there's there's no great way to do that. So, yeah, how do you EOL a BSP in a world where the kernel is completely uh, flexible, right? Perf's not going to build. All of these things that we key off of kernel source aren't going aren't gonna to work, right? Um, Another challenge, again, like this is probably because I'm an embedded developer and that's my world is that, you know, we, uh, part of it's not just a kernel and a kernel is part of the build system. You, there's inconsistent quality and testing that's done on that, that tree. So you don't, it's not even that, it's, it's, this is not a question of provenance or SBOM or knowing where it's from. It's just to even boot test this tree, you wonder sometimes when the serial port doesn't come up or, you know, something like that. So that you don't, you have no idea, right? So the challenges are how in a kernel in a build system, can you get a feeling for uh, the quality on the way in? Um, and that usually comes some sort of, we have a, like Yocto project compatibility programs and different things. That's the best that we've come up with uh, for a way to, um, but maybe there's a way you should build it and do some automated testing. And if it passes X, things, then it, the quality's there, right? I don't know. Um, and then, you know, how are you delivering? Um, and this is a particular, if you're not using, say, the Yocto project reference kernel, or your distro reference kernel, and you've done something else, how are you getting support or security updates? Because we all know vendors don't tend to come back and do even stable updates to their tree, much less CVEs and things like that. So that, that, that is a problem. And can your build system handle uh, doing those updates? 
I will do the evil thing and say that, especially the testing, the inconsistent quality does not have a technical solution. Because the one thing that we need to communicate to people who are in power to allocate resources to actually do that, they need to be convinced that uh, ensuring this quality and doing the testing and all of it that comes with it um, provides value, provides value for their company, for their business, for their um, future, whatever. Because if they are convinced, then the rest will follow. If if their objective is to just get it out of the door so we can so we can sell some system on a module, then it will never happen. It's it's a social slash uh, psychological problem and not something that can be technically addressed. So my build system's not going to fix it. Oh. I uh, I can't help thinking that in um, in uh, civil infrastructure. Uh, reliable systems, uh, critical systems, aerospace systems, this is actually pretty important. What's, what level of testing and, and assurances are you looking for? Open question. I mean, you talk about personas, right? Like, <laughs> and I, I, I'm always talking about fear. I, I, I mean, I wish Greg was still here. I, I didn't want him to think we were trying to push down a bunch of FA specific rules. I'm really talking about like what you're saying, the persona. I would love to be able to have, I mean, I can, I have an automatically built SBOM now, right? I have an automatically built license list. I can show a, a graph. I would love to be able to have an automatically built test report. Those kind of, I mean, there's P tests, of course, right? So uh, all that kind of stuff that then I, those are the personas I can hand over. And eventually it's just here, hand this. It's an output the of the build system and it's yeah. something that, yeah, exactly. It goes along. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, auditability. Any anything that happened, I should be able to show evidence. Absolutely. Of that. And what yeah. if if there was no testing? Well, it says no testing. At least you know there was no. Correct. <laughs> there was no testing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And actually, that's one of the things I have in my future slide. Luckily, uh, um, let me edit this way. You're not looking. Um, so yeah, and the other, you know, so if we continue on that, the many different, you know, the the more challenges of a kernel coming out of a build system are there's you know many different ways that kernel can be consumed. Right? Is it an SDK, um, meaning you're building out of tree modules against it. Um, you know, um, is it or is it only a binary without source? Oh, it happens. Uh, you know, where can the kernel be rebuilt? Uh, is it only in the build system, or do you actually want to provide packages as part of your output where they can rebuild the entire kernel on the target itself? Right. So that's the question. That's some of the questions that the kernel as part of a build system have to answer. And the answer is we actually. In open embedded, for example, we provide the ability to build out of tree modules on the target. And if you wanted to rebuild the whole kernel, we can't currently do that unless you've found my patch in Bugzilla where I actually package the whole kernel source tree. So you could do that, but it's not, uh, um, we don't do that. So that's how it was answered, for example, in open embedded right now. But I'm sure somebody somewhere has got a BB class in a layer that I don't know about that's packaging it, but that's the beauty of a build system that's extendable right it doesn't but not in oe core um you know and you know is the is the kernel is it is it just a reference or is it actually a production kernel meaning it's optimized we just recently went through and we turn on a lot of debug when we build the open embedded kernels by default but um ross ross are you listening ross um Ross Burton told me just recently that you know there was like 10 or 15 percent overhead because we had debug preempt on to uh, track the preemption points. And so we split it into now um, instruction level debug and runtime debug, so it's not turned on. So um, that's the question, right? So, you know, which that, that goes to which use case are you trying to optimize? You know, is your build performance important or are you more worried about your build system producing a, uh, an optimized kernel on the output? Um, and that's where I added this last night after going to the Rust talk yesterday. Um, and it comes into, is the build performance important? Because once we start getting required, say, Rust drivers in the kernel, um, all of a sudden the compiler that some of your compiler providers, anyway, the, the kernel concerns in your build system now really expand out into the tool chains even more on the way in. Because we already bootstrap and build GCC, that's fine. But we all know right now in open embedded, when we build Rust, everybody goes and has a coffee and comes back and watch a movie and on one of my build 
on one of my builders that I can't get to right now, it decides to oom and kill your SSH session. So that happens to me on one of my old builders. So yes, yeah, so there's 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 more concerns on that front. And so, you know, how is your build system going to solve the inputs of some of these as new requirements come in, right? I mean, the answer is probably for us a Rust binary to get the kernel building faster when it becomes required. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but that's that's the assumption right now, right? So, you know. One of the concerns that's uh, TBD that we'll all be running into probably sooner rather than uh, later. I think I'm almost done. How are we for time? You've answered all their questions. No, I'm just rambling. Uh, okay, so I'll go a few of, oh no, I have one more slide. I have to say. Um, thoughts, these are my thoughts, these are not my answers. <laughs> I've learned, don't give anybody an answer. Um, <laughs> it depends. Let me get back to you, let me talk to the team. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so one of the things we've started doing from the Alias side is in the users, there's the user's documentation and there's various um, aspects. We're starting, there's evidence and personas in there. And I'm sort of thinking that we might want to be putting some of those personas in the user's documentation of the kernel and start to clarify this there so that we can all start to come up with some sort of a group agreement effectively. Yeah. In a way. Because I think everybody yeah, just yeah. thinks everybody's building and using the kernel just like they are. If you know what I mean, like it's the the developer, I guess would be the one that everybody assumes everybody else is doing. But as a load build delivery, delivering, it's much different. It's completely different, right? You don't care if it takes 12 hours to produce a signed and cryptographically perfect and reproducible everything. But if your boss is looking over your shoulder because the boots inconsistently going, you don't want any, yeah, so it's a completely different world, right? And you have your own patch. How are you changing the source where you rebuild it? Yeah, is it part of the build system or is it not? Completely different. Oh. <laughs> so yeah, net net is can we can we look at trying to put some patches in the upstream user users documentation? Yeah, well, I'm yeah, sure that yeah, care. there's lots of strange things in those directories. So um, yeah, so my my thoughts are you know offer workflows, don't mandate them. Like I said, you're never going to pull VI. And a guy's cross tool chain that he got off of kernel.org eight years ago and it runs fast. And he's got his def config that he copies in and builds the kernel and SCPs it to the target. You're never going to really convince that developer that they want to use your build system way to build a kernel. So I'm saying offer a workflow if it actually is good and efficient, then they will adopt it or not. Uh, there's no way to mandate any of it, right? So that's what I say. That's exactly those that want to adopt it will. And almost any, like even two seconds of overhead is too much. They're used to typing make and the compiler starts. They don't want to watch bit bake parse for 12 seconds before it starts. So um, we, I say your build system should provide flexibility, but you do need to focus somehow your testing on some sort of reference. Otherwise you're all over the place. And, you know, is it, you know, embedded? Are you optimized for embedded? Is it enterprise? Is it hobbyist? Is it whatever, right? You need something that you can test on. Um, and do not prematurely optimize a use case. Wait till somebody actually has a real problem uh, and you can help them solve it. And again, with the reference, if you need to gather momentum and sort of resist fragmentation in some of these parts, then you do need to offer um, a reference, whether you're expecting it to go into production and be deployed um, commercially, you still need somehow to develop. Um, and of course, so there you go. I even had it in there, document model lifespan updates etc right personas so you need to you need to have some way that it's written down otherwise nobody knows what to expect from the build system and the kernel so for open embedded for example out of that list of thoughts when i was going through this presentation this is what i sort of wrote down for what we could do next enhanced testing that goes to should we be doing more of the runtime stuff and getting a better report so we can hand off to the next person in the chain to say that we at least know what works. Um, and I would say, because if you've been following, we found some fairly unique issues 
in our last two or three kernel upgrades from, from FPU initialization bugs, serial port hangs that were in it. And nobody, literally, if you find, go look on Lord, where nobody else anywhere was seeing these problems or maybe a couple of Gen 2 guys eventually found, anyway, so we found some very strange, um, um, some very unique issues from the way that we build and boot and deploy the kernel. So, you know, can we enhance what we do even more to pick those up sooner so we're not scrambling um, and delaying our release while we're trying to figure out why they're getting intermittent x86 hangs because of the serial port, not uh, <laughs> it not talking to serial port two uh, was the problem that we had. So there was a race condition. Um, you know, we're maybe we'll do more stress testing. Maybe we'll actually uh, run some benchmarks so we can chart over time. You know what we're doing both on the build side and the runtime side. Um, we want to do add some more architectures because um, right now. For example, Risk Five is not fully one of the supported architectures in uh, Open Embedded in the Yocto project. So, if you know anybody who would like to support that effort, uh, Richard would be happy to hear from them. Yep. Hi, Bruce. Um, regarding the kernel testing, uh, would you think it would be useful if we um, have like an extra set of configs when we do the validation? Not because the 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 reference kernel comes with a reference dev config or created or whatever, right? Um, so what if we increase the coverage of that? I know it would be painful to, you know, create, uh, use a kernel meta to add yeah. a bunch of configs to all the kernels when we're testing them. Some uh, of them, yeah, we have some of those configs already available. You matter do it. The only thing we want to do is make sure that they're not changing it to the point where we're not testing what everybody else will be running later, right? Like, do we want to test one set of configs and then release it with another right? <laughs> and have a, a Delta between the two, but yeah. Um, and we're looking to expand uh, also to do as there's some efforts around a binary package feed and more binary outputs from the project. So as part of that, we could do binary um, reference kernels, meaning they would be usable on generic ARM64 or x86, and you could just take it and, and have a quicker start along with the binary package feed. So that's another thing that's sort of what's next rather than always having to build it from source and interact with the build system at all just be a consumer of the output of the build system. Um, and of course, one thing that I'm always trying to do is streamline those developer workflows. So yeah. I'm done. Am I at time? Yeah. Fantastic. All right, everyone. Thanks for coming. Hopefully you all come back after the break. And nope. if you have any comments or feedback for BNRI, we'd love to hear it. We'd like to do this again on a regular basis. Thank you, Bruce.